I was really heartbroken this week to learn of the passing of legendary film director and my friend, William Friedkin. He died in Los Angeles on August 7th at the age of 87. And Billy, as many of you know, won a Best Picture Oscar for the 1971 classic, The French Connection. And he's best remembered for his 73 blockbuster, The Exorcist, on which he collaborated with my other dear pal, the late William Peter Blatty. I sat down with Billy Friedkin numerous times to interview him for this show. It was always a joy. We spent time at his home. He was just uh, insightful, irascible, endlessly engaging, and a true raconteur until the end. I'm most glad to have been able to call him a friend. Here are some of the great moments I had with Billy Friedkin over the years. In 2015, we talked about his amazing life and career, first making a name for himself as a documentary filmmaker. and what The Exorcist was really about. Spoiler alert, he called it the mystery of faith. Let me start with when you go now to a mm. movie theater, what are you looking for? Um, intensity, uh, something that, I, uh, that will hold me mm. and um, will make me a part of the story, a part of the characters. Most of, I don't see a lot of films mm. now. Most mm. of the films I see uh, that are made today yeah. um, lack any real passion. Huh. They're called um, projects now yeah. in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. They're not referred to as, as movies, let alone films. Yeah. They're all projects. Series. Um... And, and Well, they're designed, you know, just to um, attract the largest number of viewers, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I remember a time when films could be considered a work of art. Mm -hmm. I don't see that now. I was stunned to read that the father of The Exorcist, the French Connection, Bug, would say the MGM musical is the spine of the American film. Explain that to me. The MGM musical, the great musicals of the late 40s and early through the middle 50s mm -hmm. really represent the best that American films have ever made. I they agree. were all turned out by a studio, MGM, mm -hmm. in a kind of factory wow. manner. Um, they were all vehicles for people like Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly. Mm -hmm. But to me, they're absolute perfection in every way. Mm -hmm. The photography, the choreography, yeah. the music, God knows, was by the people who created the American Songbook. Yeah. Gershwin, Cole Porter, Rodgers and Hart, Rodgers and Hammerstein. Yeah. And the, the, the dances are, are, that's something that's gone from American film. Yeah. Uh, it's not that um, people wouldn't like them anymore and they've moved on. It's that nobody can do that. Yeah. There weren't many of them. <clears throat> there might have been maybe a dozen, huh. but to me, they still represent hmm. as close as one can come to perfection in filmmaking. I want to talk about your incredible career and take you back to working Why at... Why lower the level? Well, no, no, I'm taking yeah. it up a notch here. I'm continuing. Mm -hmm. This is called the continuum. Uh, you worked at WGN in Chicago and started doing a lot of live television. What did you learn there? that you later utilized and that colored your work to the present day? Television uh, production is uh, very different from film production, mm -hmm. and especially the kind of television programs that I did. They were largely interview programs, Talking panel heads. shows, news programs, sports, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of drama, a little bit of variety, mm -hmm. uh, but the techniques are totally different uh, from film techniques. What I learned, the main thing I learned when I started in the mailroom of a television station, which was WGN, WGN, and worked my way up to live television director, was that it's very much of a team effort, and it's all about communication. In order to get what you want, I learned back then, in the late 50s and early 60s, you have to be able to communicate your ideas um, to a crew and a cast before you can communicate to an audience. Mm. And what it's all about is communication. Mm. The idea of making a film or putting something on television is about communicating with an audience. And that's all it's about. Mm. 
The difference is this, Raymond, but the painter, the writer, the composer are working alone. The film director is working with a two-ton pencil. You know, mm -hmm. um, literally at times, thousands of people, people on some films, mm -hmm. it's a collaborative effort, mm -hmm. whereas the other art forms are not. Uh, you met with Blake Edwards about a script treatment he had of Peter Gunn. Mm -hmm. He let you read it, and at that moment, you met someone who would become a major collaborator in a future work, but you were not too hot on the script. I didn't like the script. It was, the script simply said by Blake Edwards, uh -huh. who I had great admiration for. Mm -hmm. I thought then and think now he was one of the great American directors. Mm -hmm. And I was a kid who had done one little film with Sonny and Cher. <laughs> I told Blake I read his script with great interest and thought it was terrible. And when I said, there was a bunch of people in the room. Uh, many of them were sitting in shadows around <laughs> this enormous office Blake had at Paramount. And after I'd said to Blake I didn't like the script, I thought it was terrible, and he thanked me uh, for letting him meet an interesting person. <laughs> and as I was leaving, this guy followed me out of the office on the Paramount lot and he introduced himself and he said I'm Bill Blatty <laughs> and he said uh, I'm the guy who wrote that script <laughs> and I said what? I says, it says by Blake Edwards he said well Blake often does that mm -hmm. he said but you know you were right I think you were right the script does need a lot of work we have all said the same thing to Blake but he doesn't want to hear that and um, I admire you for your honesty and I said, well, thank you very much. We shook hands, and that was it. That was it. And four years later, he sent me uh, the manuscript of his novel, The Exorcist. You read The Exorcist in a San Francisco, was it a hotel? It came it's a hotel, hotel room that overlooked the entire Bay Area. Hmm. And you thought what as you sat to read that? I story? thought it was really a, a very uh, powerful and important piece of work. Hmm. I thought, first of all, this is a great read. You know, th this is a wonderful story, very well handled. The characters were well drawn. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 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 about the mystery of faith, mm -hmm. which you don't read too many no popular novels mm -hmm. coming along that mm -hmm. deal with the idea of faith in a, in a way that can be comprehended. Mm -hmm. And it was a disturbing and powerful story. And I, I was reluctant to read it. I carried it with me on a, I was on the road uh -huh. doing interviews for The French Connection, which right. hadn't come out yet, mm -hmm. was about to. And the end of my tour was San Francisco and I opened the book. Oh, boy. And I started to read it, canceled my dinner plans, and Blatty included his phone number at the uh, bottom of the letter he sent me, and I called him. And I said, this is great. And he asked me if I'd be interested in making the film. Bill Blatty always considered this, the book and the subsequent film, an apostolic work, yes. one that would awaken people to the nature of evil and, by proximity, the nature of good and faith. Mm -hmm. Did you see it the same way? I agree with that. Um, but we came at it from a different mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Bill came as a believing Catholic, right. which he is. And I come to it as someone who believes in the teachings of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as they're recorded in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and I made the film as a believer, not in all the tenets of the church, right. as Bill does, mm -hmm. but in the teachings of Jesus. Yes, that's, I, that's still my position. Do you think that's why it has had the staying power and still has the resonance it has, spiritually speaking? You watch that film today. There is no doubt we are seeing the clash of not only good actors and great special effects, but there's something else happening there, that between that film and the viewer. Yes, it is a film about the constant presence of good and evil in, in all of our lives, mm -hmm. from the beginning of time, mm -hmm. Cain and Abel. Yeah. You know, the, the constant, the, the Garden of Eden, the serpent, 
uh, there was always, there has always been a powerful demonic force attempting to undo the work of the Creator throughout all of history. There has always been, you know, whether he's called the devil or the adversary mm -hmm. or whatever, there has always been this clash of good and evil. It has always been the, the burden of goodness to triumph over the threat of evil. Do you see that as a through line that runs through all your work, that, that notion you just articulated? Absolutely, yes. Hmm. Let's go back and talk about the French connection. It is, even when you watch it today, it is so gritty, it feels so real. A lot of these scenes, though, particularly the chase, they were real. You didn't get permissions, you didn't get clearances for any of this. No. Tell me how that happened well, we, and I, how you did it without getting arrested. Well, I had the cops on my side <laughs> because it was a story about police heroism. Ah. And every off-duty police officer in New York helped to protect the set. Mm. And they were all carrying their badges. And in case I got stopped for breaking every imaginable traffic <laughs> law and other laws in the making of that film, mm -hmm. I had the cops around me to protect me. There's something you say in the book. There is an outlaw quality in so many of your works, particularly The French Connection, The Exorcist. And, and what I mean by that is this, and you, you, at the end of your book you write, good and evil coexist in me in all of us, and I believe it's a constant struggle for our better angels to prevail. This is a theme in all my films and remains a personal struggle. But I've been blessed with a loving, devoted wife and two wonderful sons I dearly love, and they constantly help me suppress my darker impulses. In spite of all the gifts God has given me, I still occasionally harbor anger and resentment. My salvation is to channel them into my work. How is anger and resentment channeled into the exorcist. Well, first of all, uh, I would take out one word if I was editing that today, and that would be occasionally. Okay. <laughs> uh, like everyone else I know, mm -hmm. I harbor all of the worst qualities of humankind. I believe they are built into our DNA. Um, I'm drawn to stories on film in which the characters exhibit those qualities. Mm. I'm not drawn to comedies yeah. or love stories or kind of, you know, mindless um, uh, film. Superhero <laughs> antics. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I can't even watch that stuff. I just don't believe it. I don't buy it. Many others do, mm. and that's fine. Mm -hmm. The film industry uh, is built today on the, uh, on the idea of superheroes and supervillains, mm. and I'm much more interested in human nature. The mm. proper study of mankind is man, and I guess to put it in a simple sentence, the thing that attracts me uh, more than anything about humankind is what Isaiah Berlin called the crooked timber of humanity. Mm. I just um, make films about characters whose natures I think I understand. Mm -hmm. That's all. You made a leap to opera directing. Now, this is a very different uh, uh, box of tricks and an entirely different approach. You can control everything in film. The angle, the, the, the lighting, the delivery. You can do retake. Stage is such a different animal. Why did you decide to take on operatic directing? Uh, I've done about 15 operas I in know. about 15 years. I've done some of the great operas ever written mm -hmm. in some of the great opera houses of the world. Mm -hmm. Not all, but it's, it is not all that different. Really? The great singers that I've had the privilege of working with want the same thing as good actors. They want a psychological underpinning for their characters mm -hmm. and a staging that works. Mm -hmm. You don't have a camera. That's the main difference, right. directing opera. But you're still working with the actor-singers in the same way. They want to give a performance. They don't simply want to come out and give a concert. Mm -hmm. Because the great operas all tell a story and have characters. 
I can emphasize characters or de-emphasize them by the way I stage them with someone in the foreground or the background or the way I light them, the, way, the manner in which I set them. There was a moment in Puccini's great Suor Angelica that you directed where the Angel of Mercy appears in that production. Yes. And so many people I know who saw it, not all Catholic, were stunned by that moment. You had a major war with the composer over this. Not the composer, he's been I mean, dead. The, the, the conductor, I'm for, sorry, for that's right. almost Puccini. 100 years, Raymond. <laughs> Puccini's a little dusty right. at this point. Uh, I had conductor. a big problem with the conductor, James Conlon, who's mm -hmm. a highly regarded conductor of mm -hmm. opera. And he's the permanent conductor of the L.A. Opera. Right. And he came to me when uh, I was setting up, because in the finale of Swar Angelica, Swar Angelica asks for the mercy of the Mother of Christ, and in Puccini's libretto, he says, the Mother of Mercy appears. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say a shadow of the cross goes across <laughs> the stage, a stained glass window lights up. He says, the Mother of Mercy appears. Mm -hmm. And I decided to make that moment real. Mm -hmm. And the conductor, Conlon said to me, uh, listen, he took me aside, he said, you know, I had a Catholic education and I don't believe that stuff anymore. Mm. And uh, he said, I wish you wouldn't do that. And I said, Jim, I, I don't uh, really want to remind you of this, but this story is not about you or what you believe or don't believe or what, my, what I believe or don't believe. I said, I know you read music and conduct it beautifully, but can you read a libretto? <laughs> can you read where it says here, the mother of mercy appears? That's what I'm doing. Mm. And after we did it, there was not a dry eye in the house. Mm. Men in tuxedos were weeping. Mm. Every woman in the house, non-believers. And Placido Domingo, who's the director of the LA Opera Company, right. said to me, Billy, tonight, you have made all of Los Angeles Catholic. In 2018, Billy Friedkin returned to the show to talk about the 45th anniversary of The Exorcist and his return to the theme of demonic possession, for real this time, with his documentary, The Devil and Father Amort. I was even treated to a walking tour of Georgetown's exorcist locations with the master himself. Watch. Father Amort begins every exorcism by thumbing his nose at the devil. In the room are Christina's family and other priests to assist Father Amort. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi peccatori, adesso e l'ora della nostra morte. Amen. Joining me now is the Academy Award-winning director of The French Connection and The Exorcist to discuss his new documentary, The Devil and Father Amort. Would you welcome back to the program William Friedkin. Thanks, Raymond. Great to see you. Always well, good to see you. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Nice. Uh, I want to first talk about something, clear something up for me. I read the New York Times last week. Maureen Dowd said that you claimed the 1949 case that The Exorcist is based upon was, quote, jive. What I does that mean? I didn't say uh, that I claimed it was jive. The 1949 case, which took place in Silver, uh, in Cottage City, Maryland, mm -hmm. misreported huh. as, as Silver, Silver Spring, Spring right. and a bunch of other places. There's no evidence for that. There's no proof. Mm. What inspired Bill Blatty to write The Exorcist were reports of that case. Ah. News reports that said this had happened. This had happened, and it was a case of possession mm -hmm. and a successful exorcism. Mm -hmm. Now, that just passed along into history without people bothering to do a lot of research about mm -hmm. it. One fellow did and wrote a story that you can see on Wikipedia, yeah. which is definitive. It's called The Haunted Boy of Cottage City, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty authentic. Huh. And I believe over the years that I'm not saying that the case 
didn't happen the way it was reported, but the fact that it was reported was what influenced Blatty. Right. He did not use any of the characters. No, or he the circumstances. He the place, yeah. the circumstance, and he obviously had never seen an exorcism. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Now, Bill said he came into possession of one of the priests, one of the exorcist's diaries l years later. That's what I've been told. Did you ever see that? No, but I, you know, I've been told by Bill's wife mm -hmm. that she still has the diary of the priest who did the exorcism, mm -hmm. Father William Bowdern, at mm -hmm. Alexian Brothers Hospital in St. Louis. Wow. In 1949. This week, we visited a few of the iconic Georgetown locations featured in The Exorcist, and Mr. Friedkin gave us insight into each location. Bill, why this house? Why did you choose this house as the house where The Exorcism was going to take place? This is the house that Blatty had in mind when he wrote the novel. It was the closest house to the steps, but as you'll see, it wasn't close enough. <laughs> but it was the house. This is the exterior of the house where we filmed The Exorcist. It's 3600 Prospect in Georgetown. As you will see in a moment, it is not anywhere near enough to the steps, which are a good, I don't know, 25 to 30 yards away. So what we did, that fence was not there. We had to put up this fence for her later to protect the house, but that fence wasn't there. What we did was we built a false front and a false extension from the end of that house to where the stairs begin. A lot of scenes shot at that front door, both looking out this way and looking back into the house. This is the beginning of the area of the exorcist steps. 75 steps from just a few feet away to the bottom. Uh, the false front came out to here where these trees are. The girl's bedroom window is just up there where I'm pointing, right up here. And the stunt man went out a window in the sound stage first. He jumped from the little girl's bedroom window in the sound stage, and it finished off with a shot of him coming out that window right above me, which looked exactly like the house was extended this far. The stuntman came out of where I showed you, and he landed on that first landing. That's pretty far. All of the steps and the corners were padded with rubber. So he was landing on a padded surface, and he was all padded, but it was an incredible jump from right up there where I just showed you to the first landing where he hit. And that's the only place from which I filmed the jump. I also rigged a camera there's a shot in the sequence, if you see it again, where I rigged a camera on wires to go out the window so it looks like a POV shot. All the way to the bottom, where that gentleman is now, and over that plate is where Father Karras dies in a pool of blood and receives the last rites from his friend, Father Dyer. Now, why 45 years later would William Friedkin go back and focus again on something you said you'd never focus again on in film? And I quote you, I would never do anything with demonic possession or exorcism in it. Why do this documentary now? Because I believe in its authenticity, mm -hmm. and I would never do anything, I, I still say, in fiction. I would never do a fiction version of it again. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to meet Father Amort quite by accident. I asked him if I could interview him for Vanity Fair magazine. Mm -hmm. He gave me a long, it turned out to be 6,500 word interview wow. for Vanity Fair. That's a book. Yeah. 
<laughs> and it was reprinted everywhere. Mm -hmm. And during the course of the interview, he's the most spiritual man I've ever met, Raymond. Mm. And I asked him at the end of the interview if he would ever allow me to witness an exorcism, mm. thinking he would not. And he said, well, let me think about it. And a couple of days later, I got an email from his, uh, the head of the Pauline Order in Rome mm -hmm. who said that Father Amort would allow me to witness an exorcism on May 1st of 2016. Wow. And I had originally met him in March. So uh, once he said, okay, you can witness this, which permission is never granted. Right, never. I can tell you, never, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. um, I then pushed my luck and said, well, would you let me film it, Father? Mm. And word came back two days later saying you could film it, but alone with no crew and no lights. Huh. So I went in with a little still camera that shoots high definition video and, sh and sat two feet away from them while they were doing it. Wow. Now you say the exorcism and Bill Blatty used to tell me the same thing. The exorcist, he said, is about the mystery of faith. Is that what this documentary, The Devil and Father Amortis? To some great extent, certainly. I mean, there's no proof of anything, Raymond. Mm -hmm. There is not one person in this entire world that know the greatest philosophers, religious scholars, whatever, do not know if there is a heaven, a hell, an afterlife, why we were born, what our purpose is here. It's never going to be revealed until, let us assume, there is an afterlife. Mm -hmm. But Bertrand Russell, Teilhard de Chardin, uh, all were offering informed opinion and belief. Mm -hmm. But there's no hard evidence. If, you're, if you need a fact, there are those who need to have their hands in the blood mm -hmm. in order to believe. Now, I have tremendous faith in the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ, but I don't know anything, and neither do people a thousand times smarter than me. Mm -hmm. Give me a sense of the, what this means to you as a filmmaker. You started your career doing a documentary about a man on death row, The People versus Paul Crump, and here you are all these years later doing another documentary focused really on the thing you're probably best known for as a filmmaker, exorcism, the exorcist. Why make that journey? Any trepidation about turning this into a film once you had the footage of the real exorcism? Yes, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Mm -hmm. I filmed it because Father Amort allowed me to film it, mm -hmm. and the woman and her family said, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then I thought, well, what... I didn't think I would make a documentary out of it. I thought I would have this mm -hmm. to show to interested people. Mm -hmm. And then I got the thought to take it to some of the leading brain surgeons in the country and the leading psychiatrists. Why would you do that? Well, I felt that they would either debunk it mm -hmm. and or explain in medical and psychological terms what it was. Mm -hmm. What did Father Amort and his lifelong example teach you not about evil but about good that a man was there willing to devote his skills and his life to helping to liberate people of what they believed what had them completely in check mm. and in choke mm -hmm. their lives were not their own and they went to father amort as a last resort mm and he liberated many of them. But he never believed he did the liberation. They always call upon Jesus to do the exorcism. That's what the prayer is. It's not the priest as, come out of there. as yeah. in my film at one point saying, I cast you out. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus that they're praying to, to cast out the demon. Mm -hmm. And that's what Father Mort believed. And I believed in him mm -hmm. and still do. What do you want people to take away from this project? After seeing this film, what do you hope it's going to accomplish? Well, it was better said by Shakespeare mm. in his play Hamlet, when he had Hamlet say to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth 
than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Mm -hmm. And that's my belief. Mm -hmm. I believe there's just so many things that I don't know or understand, but I'm still curious about, mm -hmm. but don't know or understand. And hopefully this film, which is not fiction at all, not special effects, not, does not set out to terrify you or show you outrageous events, mm -hmm. The, the possession enough is outrageous enough, but I believe that this film is a, a, a doorway into that, mm. into more things in heaven and earth. And one of the doctors in the film that I interviewed, who I showed the exorcism to, said, well, and he's the man who's in charge of brain mapping, mm -hmm. said, well, just because we don't believe in something or know something, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Ah. It's kind of a double negative, but it's true it nevertheless. Works. We don't know about this, but that doesn't mean it isn't true mm -hmm. or doesn't have a name or will not get another name later, like radiation. Right. You know, they knew nothing about it right. when it occurred. Now it's a field of study. Mm. William Friedkin, always a pleasure. Thank Mine, you. Raymond, thank you. I look forward to the next project, and we'll have you back. I always love to come back and to watch this great show. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. And my dear pal, the great William Friedkin, rest in peace. And I know he's arguing with our friend Bill Blatty. <laughs>